Run Sky is brought to you in part by Coca-Cola, serving Alaskans quality soft drinks since 1937. By Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, an Alaska Native Corporation promoting economic and social progress for people throughout the state. One Sky, a special presentation of Heartbeat Alaska, a forum for Native issues and concerns. One voice, one sky. Welcome to One Sky. I'm Jeannie Green. One Sky is a discussion on the events and issues that affect the lives of our Native peoples around the world. Today, John Tedpon speaks with Mr. Thomas, Mr. James W. Thomas, a Clinket formerly from Yakutat. He now resides in Washington. Mr. Thomas is in demand internationally and nationally as a keynote speaker for general audiences on different issues that affect Natives and non-Natives. He was brought to Alaska by the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society as one of their key speakers. <laughs> okay. Let, let's explain that. <laughs> First of all, uh, John, as you know, I'm a Clinket Indian from Yakutat, Alaska, originally. I now reside down in the States. But uh, this represents my, my clan, which is Raven. And we follow the mother's moiety. So all of the children of the mother come from Raven, or if, if she's eagle, then from that side. Mm -hmm. And because of uh, my great-grandmother coming from the other side of Yakutat to the north, we came around Mount St. Elias. And this we symbolize as our mountain yeah. and uh, the people and the protectors of the mountain, basically, is what uh, this symbolizes. And this is what we dance in. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. You're here to speak to the, the Native American Fish and Wildlife uh, Society. Uh, what, what is that organization all about? They asked me to come in uh, to speak primarily from the tribal perspective of, of the tribes in the United States. This is a national organization that was organized uh, about 1987. They're approximately, 1982, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and they're approximately 12 years old now. They provide primarily technical assistance to the tribes so that the tribes can protect their natural resources through a co-management program, which is a very nice approach when you consider how monstrous the federal government is or any state government can be. And together, they can work together so that they can bring about uh, a way of <coughs> excuse me, preserving their natural resources while also enhancing it for the future of their children. Will, will, will the Native American Society <coughs> and our uh, Fish and Wildlife Society get involved when, in issues like subsistence then? Yes, I believe in Alaska they're moving uh, you know, very quickly mm -hmm. in, into that area and seeking ways that they can work things out with the state of Washington as, or state of Alaska as well as uh, the federal government. So there will be some uh, position papers and, and some conclusions, I suppose, that uh, uh, that will be forwarded to the state and federal government as far as subsistence issues are concerned? Yes, I'm not that familiar with the subsistence issue up mm -hmm. here, except for what I've heard as I've traveled back and forth. I commercial fish in Yakutat every summer. That's my relax yeah. time. And uh, I believe that uh, the federal government has taken over some of these responsibilities but they've handed over to uh, five separate agencies regulatory powers over subsistence, which becomes extremely confusing. So I think what the society is hoping is that the individual native groups mm -hmm. can actually sit down with these agencies, including the state, and work out ways that they can manage together the resources so that while they're all fighting over this, we don't lose the yeah. resource. You've got a long history of, of working with um, tribal entities, uh, working towards tribal rights and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, where do you see <coughs> as a whole of the, the Native American people here in Alaska in the lower 48? Where, where, what, what, where are they at in this regard? Well, the subject I'll be addressing tomorrow is sovereignty. Okay. And, and that's, a, I yeah. believe, a very ticklish issue in Alaska. In, in the South... It raises a lot of red flags. Huh? That's right. It yeah. terrifies a lot of people. And uh, 
it's strange, you know, it didn't terrify the federal government when the states were uh, raising their sovereign mm -hmm. rights, because states are sovereign as well. But in, in the states, the way we address this is that uh, the most sacred law of any land is the right to make and to honor treaties. And as you know, in the United States, the tribes did treaty mm -hmm. with the United States. So they have established themselves as sovereign governments because the fact that the United States treated with the Indians established the fact of their sovereignty. Sovereignty that is equal to the nation which is called the United States okay. and therefore above state sovereignty because states as you know cannot treaty. So this is a ticklish issue but it's, it's, it's coming home. People are finally beginning to realize that the Indian tribes of the United States are sovereign. How about, how about Indian tribes here in Alaska? <clears throat> You're going to corner me, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the way I look at it, and of course I'm not an attorney, but I've dealt with the tribes for 22 years. In Alaska, we were treated on, on our behalf by a government that was not the United States, but the government of Russia, mm -hmm. of old Russia, when they supposedly, in quotes, sold Alaska to the United States, they did not sell the land. They sold the right to rule and to tax and to trade with this area called Alaska. And the government of Russia stated to the United States, we did not claim, nor do we claim, to have conquered the people, the aboriginal people of Alaska, and therefore we have no right to sell the land. Therefore, in a sense, they recognized us as a nation of people, aboriginal. So does that mean that native tribes here in Alaska are sovereign? Not being a lawyer, that would be my interpretation. Because we are natives, we are Indians, we are Aleuts, we are Eskimo, we, we're the rulers of our territories. As you know, none of us profess to claim land because the earth was always our mother and sky is father. So we never professed to possess land. We were simply trustees of it. Yeah. And we would transfer the trusteeship over to someone like the United States. The Supreme Court has held that Indian nations are indeed sovereign nations within a sovereign protective nation. So we are dependent sovereign nations. And I believe that that would flow to the Alaska Natives. Okay. <clears throat> in, the, in the discussion uh, about uh, fish and wildlife uh, and the Native American society, uh, where, does sovereignty, uh, where does the sovereignty issue come into play here? In, as far as the... Um, yeah, there, there are s the society let, let me itself. give you an example. Okay. <clears throat> let me give you an example of what's been happening in, in the last decade or so. Um, some villages in rural Alaska have claimed that since they are a sovereign uh, group, uh, they should have uh, control over the fish and wildlife uh, resources on their land. Um, and that's been a, a point of contention between them and the state and the federal government for a long time. Where does sovereignty uh, uh, come in, in in this kind of conflict? I think what we'd have or to... Or in your experience of where, wherever you, you, you've been in the lower 48. Well, in, in the lower 48, which I think would extend up here, if uh, we have what we call Indian reservations. Mm -hmm. So these are very defined lands. Within the reservations, of course, the tribes have their jurisdiction over what whatever animals and yeah. so forth are there. However... Uh, the tribes always refer to an area that is called the seeded area. If you take, for example... Seeded. C-E-D-E-D. Uh -huh. -E -D. Right. Right. That means um, given over. Given over. To. Yes. Um, taking, for example, the Yakimas in, okay. in Washington State, they now have about 1.3 million acres of land. But they seeded over to the United States over 10 million. So their seeded area is substantially greater than the reservation. Mm -hmm. They enjoy the same rights in terms of some of the resources that they have on the reservation within that ceded area. So, for example, if they have to go for hunts, 
for subsistence purposes or particularly for religious purposes, you know, mm -hmm. like we have potlatches and, yeah. and these kind of things, powwows. Um, they are empowered to, to go out of their area and hunt in the seeded area for those purposes. So in, in that fashion, if we looked at Alaska, we'd be looking at the, the lands that, uh, we, uh, that, they, that our title was taken from us for in, in, in exchange for this Alaska Native claims. But we essentially gave up this entire state. If you look at mm -hmm. it that way, we have ceded the entire state of Alaska hanging on to some 44 million acres within our own jurisdictions under our corporations. In that way, I would say that, yes, indeed, these resources are under the jurisdiction of the people of Alaska, the native people of Alaska. And uh, that at, at very minimum, we should have the right to use this food as we traditionally have without wanton waste for our uh, sustenance. Some of the uh, villages <coughs> have, um, uh, have said that they, they would like to be more involved in the, in the management uh, of of fish and wildlife resources. Um, maybe we can get to that uh, right after a break. Uh Welcome back. John Tetpon interviews James W. Thomas, a Clinket formerly from Yakutat, Alaska, now living in Washington State. He does spend his summers here, as he mentioned, as a commercial fisherman and was recently elected to the Yakutat Kwan Corporation in Yakutat as vice president. One of the questions that I have, Jim, is, is the villages, some of the villages are, are very adamant about co-managing fish and wildlife resources um, in a, in a uh, situation where there, there, there's very little and it's been very hard to come by uh, participation on their part in managing their own fishing game. Uh, where do you see that coming in the future? Well, what has to happen is uh, the, the uh, village governments, whether they're tribal governments, and I'm assuming that they all will be uh, tribal governments, will be dealing with the federal government on a government-to-government -government basis. And essentially, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll come down to the villages working with the state on a government-to-government -government basis. And this is where co-management comes into play okay. and, and, uh, and can do wonderful things. The, what has to be realized, and this is what I will say to the group tomorrow morning, is that when you sit at a table, you have to know who is on the other side. If it's the federal government, obviously, it's humongous. Mm -hmm. If it's the state, it's also going to be humongous. In the same token, you've got to know yourself. Who am I? What is my tribe? Who am I representing? But more important, as you get down to negotiations, is that you have to know what the regulations are. Yeah. You have to know who the regulators are in your area, but more important that, than that is to know who the regulators of the regulators are. Once you have an understanding of this picture, then you can get down to some real effective government-to-government -government relationships. You know, one of the, uh, <coughs> uh, in a more philosophical vein, one of the more uh, con bigger conflicts, I think, uh, that we've seen in the, in the past uh, several decades is, is how regulation can change uh, culture. Um, we grew up, for the most part, hunting and fishing in a seasonal way, which is very different from biological management, mm -hmm. okay? And so the, the establishment of regulation has really thrown the native culture in, 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 a, in a lurch. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? 
Well, I think what, uh, what has to come from the federal government and from the state is an understanding of cultural values. Mm -hmm. We cannot eliminate these things. I don't care how many regulations you write, if you totally destroy the cultural values that are attendant to the foods that we use, you actually destroy the people. Because as you know, uh, the more we have been brought to this Campbell soup can mm -hmm. uh, society, the more we have become susceptible to diseases, to diabetes, mm -hmm. to cancer. Mm -hmm. Cultural understanding has to come into play, and there has to be room left for it. This is not such a monstrous mm -hmm. state that we can ignore the people. The native people are still a major part of this state, and that recognition should come from both the feds and the state of Alaska. Do you think there'll be ever be a time when the state and federal government agencies uh, who, who, who have a, a lot of power over fish and wildlife resources will ever come to an understanding that cultural values, the things you're, you're talking about, uh, will, can, can be interfaced with, with uh, a biological management. Can, it, can that ever happen? Well, let me answer it this way. I heard something on the radio yesterday as I was driving to the airport. Paul Harvey was talking about the hantavirus, mm -hmm. which is this, uh, the virus that comes from uh, you know, rodents and so on. Yeah. And he said, for everything that the scientists were doing and had attempted and tried and studied, it was the Navajo people who came to the scientists and said, you'd better look at this. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was from the uh, droppings and so on of the rodent that this disease evolves. So I think we know a lot. You know, yeah. I always tell audiences, it, Indians and Alaska Natives always kind of get a smile on their face when they have a scientific discovery because we've always known it. Mm -hmm. We are the finest managers, I think, of the land, of our resources. We are the first environmentalists. We're the first conservationists to the point where we actually apologize to the animal that we're going to take for food yeah. because we regard them as brother and sister. So I don't see where uh, anyone can look upon us as abusers simply because we want to use our animals and our resources for our just daily living. Okay. There's some um, <clears throat> movement on, on the Kuskokwim Delta and, and has been for a long time uh, of trying to get uh, the state and federal government or whomever uh, manages uh, uh, waterfowl mm -hmm. to allow those people to go back to the time when they would hunt in the spring. You know, this is how we used to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's no longer, that, that's something that we've had a hard time uh, uh, getting the federal, state and federal government to, to uh, um, agree to. Now that's a cultural thing, you know. We hunt with the seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the biological management style is a lot different. You cannot hunt in the spring because that's when the birds are nesting, right? Where those, where, how, how does that fit in? How can those two things come together, do you think, if at all? Well, <clears throat> somehow, we've got to get some good native PR people, and we've got to educate America. We've got to educate Alaskans mm -hmm. in general, and we've got to educate ourselves to educate others. Because what we have to say to the people who say, oh no, you can't do it this way, biology is so much smarter, is to say, well, if it was so disruptive, how is it that we did it this way for those so many years yeah. and none of those animals and birds disappeared? Right. <clears throat> there, there, were <clears throat> there, there are no stories that I can recall uh, of uh, any species of fish and wildlife ever uh, becoming extinct in, 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 our, in our management style, at least. Uh, you hunt when they're around and, and you leave them alone after, after they nest. Abaditya, our creator, through the power of the eagle, communicates, protects, and guides us through the circle of life. Today, it is our responsibility to protect our wildlife for ourselves, our children, and the children to come. His journey is our journey, and we must listen to the message that he brings.
During the Roman era, 28 was considered old. In the 1800s, 60 was over the hill. You got it! has disappeared on us. Down, I'm not sure down, in, Lo down in Bellingham mm -hmm. or Washington? That's right. You know, they yeah. allowed a, a huge fishery there. You took them by the hundreds of tons. And uh, now, I, just before I came up here, I heard on the television that they are going to close silver salmon and king salmon fisheries in all of Washington State, and possibly Oregon, for this entire coming year. No fishing commercially, no sport fishing, period, zilch. Now, science was involved in all of this, and yet it has failed. So it, we cannot simply say that uh, science coming into the equation mm -hmm. saves things. Whether you've got people sitting down co-managing, science itself can make mistakes. We had a real drastic chum salmon uh, disaster here last year. Uh, the runs uh, of chum salmon into Kuskokwim and the Yukon were, were really, really uh, low. And, and, and there, there was a, a time when people on the, along the river said, we're going to fish anyway. Um, and science had, had something to do with that too. And like you said, <coughs> science can do its part, but it's, sometimes it's not always right. Uh, we're also looking at uh, chum salmon fishery decline on, on, the, on the northern western Arctic coast. Um, in, fa in the face of these things, the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society has probably has its job cut, uh, cut out for it. What do you see in, in, in terms of looking at um, issues like this? They're, they're going to have a big job educating our people. Mm -hmm. um, the different areas that I've talked about in terms of the abilities you have when you sit down. But uh, going back, we have to also sit down with our own people, with our elders, and explain that things are happening that we sometimes don't understand. Well, I fish in Yakutat in the summer times. Our average silver salmon has been 12 pounds. This year, we couldn't even break seven and a half pounds. The fish were smaller than sockeye. Mm. A very strange phenomenon. And we're saying, what's happening? We thought the fish came back too early. But the fish and game uh, people said, no, these are mature five-year fish that are coming back at seven and a half pounds. Wow. And we well, that's say, quite a difference. Yeah, well, it's, it's terrible. It, what's, what's happening, do you think? The theory is that uh, the, the ocean is running out of food. We have these crazy assumptions that the ocean is an, a limitless supply mm -hmm. of food yeah. in terms of the food chain. Perhaps our silvers ran through uh, Prince William Sound during the big oil spill. And maybe that food chain was gone when they came through. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of things happen. And uh, sometimes you have to take a major step like they're doing in Washington and simply say, we have to stop completely in order to bring it back. That seems a uh, that seems a little hard to take in, in in the face of the in face of the fact that that we've not had these kinds of problems in the past. Uh, I remember growing up as a kid, we'd we'd uh, go up the river, and sane, and we did it every summer, summer after summer, year after year, and the, the, there was no decline. Uh, it's hard to understand, and it's hard for people out in the, in the villages to understand that there is a decline in, in, in fisheries especially, subsistence fisheries. Now, that decline is going to have something to do with cultural shock. You'll, have, you'll have people who can no longer go to the fish camp, for example, and do the summer fishing uh, thing. So that, that's going to have an impact. Um, where do you see that going if we continue in this, in this pattern? It's, it's very difficult to say. You know, some of the things we can do, and I don't know whether the, this can be done on the Cusco Quim, 
Is that where the issue is primarily? Well, on? Pr primarily on the Kuskokwim and the Tanana River, uh, Yukon River, and rivers uh, below Nome, around Nome. River, there are rivers around Nome where people cannot fish or subsistence fish anymore. They, 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 so they've stopped going to the fish camp in the summer mm -hmm. as they have done for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's a cultural, you know, it's, 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 there's a cultural lurch there. It's tragic because that's, that's where we hang on to our traditional mm -hmm. ways. It's where we, we're able to at least sit grandfather with grandchild. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes in our communities we don't have that opportunity. When it's, when it's declining at such a rate that it's not understood by any of us, but by the native people, by the scientists, by the state or the federal government, then sometimes, as the tribes have done in the South, they turn to raising their own. So you, you build hatcheries or mm -hmm. you build some kind of enhancement program to bring the salmon back to that stream. There's always the fear that you're going to introduce um, disease yeah. to the wild runs. But if your wild runs are disappearing, then alternatives have to be made and measured because you don't want the fish to disappear. It's, it's part of our health as well. The Lummi tribe has had a, a long experience in, in, in farming, fish farming. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, they had a real nice experience. You know, they built this huge 750-acre pond. Mm -hmm. And at first, they, were, they had another hatchery um, several miles up, up into the mountains. And they would bring the fry down into this pond. And they were going to raise them there. Well, lo and behold, the crabs ate through the, the nets. Oh. And so all the fish disappeared. Well, they figured this is the end of it. Three years later, the gates were loaded with fish. The fish returned to the pond, wow. which blew the minds of the scientists. And now they still do. And uh, the tribe will allow fishing to take place in this area where the fish are coming back to the pond. But again, the fish are smaller. You know, they're not the same thing as the wild run. And I think that's why we have to really as a native people protect that wild run. We have to watch what other people are doing with these hatcheries and so forth. Mm -hmm. so those may be dangerous. They may destroy our wild runs. Thank you for joining us on One Sky and thank you Mr. James W. Thomas and John Ted Pond. Join us again next week for One Sky where we'll be visiting with Mr. Thomas once again. The subject this time Indian Casino Gaming and Bingo Halls. Very very fascinating subject We'll see you then. The Native American Fish and Wildlife Society was established in 1983 for the purpose of developing a national communications network to exchange information and management techniques related to tribal fish and wildlife management. Early development was pursued by dedicated professionals who saw the need to manage and conserve tribal wildlife resources. Through the years, other Native American groups from across the country joined the efforts of these early pioneers to further promote the concept of self-sufficiency in resource management and to enhance protection of sovereign jurisdiction over tribal resources. Today, the society is comprised of seven regions, with Alaska being the most recent addition. Two board members from each region are elected by their membership as representatives to the National Association.